Hi, this is Pod Save the UK. I'm Coco Khan. And I'm Nish Kumar. This week, we're leaving the Westminster bubble behind to focus on the politics that really matter to our everyday lives. Our councils are going bankrupt, and that affects the local services we all rely on. It's the crisis that no one wants to talk about. Apart from us, we'll be joined by Joe Harris, a council leader and vice president of the Local Government Association, and Zoe Billingham, the director of the Institute for Public Policy Research North. Hi, Nish. Hi, Coco. How are you? Do you want the the real answer? Oh, we're starting off. <laughs> yeah. This is like when the Fresh Prince does a very special episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a serious issues episode. It's, it's not. What's it's really wrong? not. But basically, I'm knackered yeah. because I've been having mad dreams. Really, <laughs> I've always had very vivid dreams, always. But, you know, I'm doing Dry January now. I'm meant to be sleeping better. Right, yeah, yeah. No, not better. It's like all the little weird goblins that live inside my brain are, are like not... They're not being kind of held back by Malibu and Coke. And, <laughs> and now they're like, oh, yeah, here we go, baby. Like flying you, around like dementors in my mind. Are the dreams nightmares? Well, this is the thing. So, or just very vivid? A little bit of both, right? Yeah. Last night I had a dream yeah. that someone that I used to work with and yeah. I decided to embezzle one of his rich relatives. So we faked a marriage and at some point we have to go on the run like kind of Bonnie and Clyde. And this kind of wealthy relative that we're embezzling, is he's quite grotesque. He's always got egg yolk over his face <laughs> and he's really like sort of old and posh and he lives in this grand old house and it's red, red curtains and oak panels everywhere. And there's also some sort of light nudity going on with other minor characters, but in this kind of scary what, way. Light nudity? Just what like, does that mean? Just like passing characters in the dream. Do you know what I mean? But they're just nude. Yeah, but always in like a, it's kind of erotic, but then also it's kind of horrifying. Like maybe they've got like six foot nipples or something. Do you know what I mean? Like well, I, I, I find all nudity equal parts erotic <laughs> and horrifying. <laughs> I was just one of this, and I woke up this morning like, oh, like that. And with the, the words, we need to buy Ribena, just knocking it around my head. Yeah, I'm just, I'm really frazzled. It's been going on for weeks. I don't understand <laughs> how you taking alcohol out of your diet <laughs> has caused your subconscious to run amok. I don't get it either. I think we, we need to start keeping track. I think you need to keep a dream journal, at yeah. least until the end of dry January. Other than that, big week for me, my tour's gone on sale. Oh, wow. My UK tour has gone on sale, UK and Ireland. Although the people of Ireland are understandably frustrated with me referring to it as a UK and Ireland tour because I'm doing a UK tour and I'm doing one date in Dublin. So right. I'd like to apologise to the people of Ireland uh, for only doing a, a Dublin date. The tour is called Nish Don't Kill My Vibe. <laughs> That's good. I like that. That's it's really fun, right? good. Yeah, it's yeah, fun. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's fun. And as usual... I've been nailing the promo. Uh, I tried to tweet some pictures, but I tweeted them too low red so nobody could read any of the information. But for clarity, are you going to kill vibes? Or? I Well, my stand-up is, has been described as vibe killing. <laughs> it's funny. It's just not fun. <laughs> it, there's, but, there's, people laugh a lot, but they also are reminded that everything is terrible. That's like when people are like, oh, you know, I love my family, but I don't like them. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what well, to make of it. I think we can all agree this has been another fantastic plug. <laughs> Tickets available at nishkumar.co.uk. What happens when one of China's most prominent human rights activists escapes house arrest in China, lands in America as a hero of freedom and democracy, then somehow re-emerges a few years later as an avid Trump supporter? This is the story of Chen Guang Cheng. In Crooked's newest podcast, Dissident at the Doorstep, hosts Alison Clayman, Colin Jones and Yong Yong Cheng tell the story of how a person can become a symbol for American values and what happens to them next. The first episode of Dissident at the Doorstep just dropped. You can find new episodes every Saturday in the Pod Save the World feed. Listen now. Westminster this week, there was more Tory infighting as former cabinet minister Simon Clark, although when we say former cabinet minister, 
He was in cabinet for a month uh, under Liz Truss. Um, Anyway, he wrote a Telegraph op-ed calling on the party to replace Rishi Sunak as leader to avoid what he called sleepwalking towards an avoidable annihilation at the next election. But instead of firing the starter pistol on another leadership race, it's gone down like a bucket of sick with his colleagues. The Times reported that senior Tories have turned on him with former Home Secretary Priti Patel calling his antics divisive self-indulgence. And apparently, uh, according to various reports, the reaction on Tory WhatsApp groups is get behind the PM or get lost. I say you can and will do both, (laughs) Conservative Party. You will get behind the PM and then you will get lost, I suspect. (laughs) Meanwhile, in the Commons, the Prime Minister updated MPs following another round of airstrikes against Houthi rebels in Yemen. Last night, we hit two military sites just north of Sana'a, each containing multiple specific targets, which the Houthis used to support their attacks on shipping. And Mr Speaker, I want to be very clear. We are not seeking a confrontation. We urge the Houthis and those who enable them to stop these illegal and unacceptable attacks. But if necessary, the United Kingdom will not hesitate to respond again in self-defence. While some MPs, particularly on the Labour left, have voiced concerns over escalating tensions in the region, the Labour leadership is backing the government on this. Although Keir Starmer wasn't briefed beforehand, he said he supported the targeted action, which was carried out together with the US. Elsewhere in Labour news, uh, Labour is showing no signs of cozying up to the SNP. Uh, The party has dismissed an invitation from Scottish First Minister Hamza Youssef for them to meet to discuss a future working relationship. Despite Hamza Youssef trying to butter up the leader by saying it was inevitable that Starmer would be Prime Minister. When I speak to Keir Starmer, I hope he takes me up on the invitation Uh, to me. That would be the grown-up, I think, responsible thing for him to do. Um, that I will advocate for a second independence referendum because I've got all of the reasons why I think uh, our mandate has been ignored over the years and I hope he'll take a, a, a respectful approach to listening to Scotland's voice. That's Hamza Youssef speaking to the BBC's Laura Koonsberg. And that working relationship always feels unlikely because there's too many Labour MPs that have a recent memory of being burned by the 2015 Tory election campaign where the Conservative Party ran a series of attack ads with Alex Salmond with Ed Miliband in his pocket and tried to push the idea that a Labour government would lead to the collapse of the union. So whatever people might think about the practicality of a Labour SNP mm. pact, uh, I think it's pretty unlikely to happen. This week, we also saw an embarrassing fail from the government on one of the the few universally welcome changes they've managed to bring in. That's the free childcare for two-year-olds. The rollout of a scheme to provide 15 hours per week free childcare to some working parents from April has been hit by delays and an IT meltdown. The government is insisting no families will miss out and is writing to parents with a workaround for the IT issue. But campaigners say the government is in total denial over the problem. And look, With all of these problems facing the country, with that IT meltdown system that's going to affect a huge number of people, the Conservatives, to be fair to them, have been focused on what is really important, forming another stupid fucking group. (laughs) An SFG, uh, the Conservative Party absolutely loves to form stupid fucking groups, SFGs. Uh, There's the New Conservatives, the Conservative Growth Group, uh, the Common Sense Group, and now uh, there is a new SFG Popular conservatism, uh, which is uh, abbreviated to PopCon and is a new movement aiming to restore democratic accountability to Britain and deliver popular conservative policies. And the old reverse Midas herself, Liz Truss, uh, is involved. So I think we can all expect this to go very, very badly. Um, It's uh, uh, just another group just designed to create pressure on Rishi Sunak from the right of the party. And, you know, I just think it's great to see them focusing on the priorities that the people in this country have. More stupid fucking groups. I want there to be more. I want there to be more SFGs. Eventually, I want the Tory party conference to just be a string of seething groups of people who all hate each other but are stood under different separate banners. I don't know how many more, like, kind of every man terms they can find. Do you know what I mean? I, I mean, uh, calling yourself popular is like me describing myself as a ladies' man. <laughs> it, it, it's not a term you should attach to yourself and... Anyway, it's hugely inaccurate. I like the fact that they're taking their policy of just declaring Rwanda to be a safe country into the naming of their new groups. We're just declaring ourselves popular. (laughs) 
Westminster politics tends to suck up all the attention, but there's a growing political crisis happening right on our doorstep. Our councils are going bust. That potentially affects all of us and the areas affected are countless from our bins to our parks, our libraries, our leisure centres. It could affect transport services that help the elderly get out and about, not to mention youth clubs that keep young people off the streets. Nearly one in five councils in England expects to declare bankruptcy within the next 15 months. Back in 2018, Northamptonshire County Council became the first local authority for 20 years to have to issue a Section 114 notice. This means a council is effectively declaring bankruptcy and all new spending, with the exception of protecting vulnerable people and statutory services, must stop immediately. Since then, they've been followed by Slough, my hometown Croydon, Durrock, Woking, Birmingham City and Nottingham City. The local government association estimates that councils in England face a deficit of at least three billion over the next two years. The latest places to sound warnings about imminent financial collapse include Stoke-on-Trent, Middlesbrough, Somerset, Bradford and Cheshire East. With an election on the horizon, there are signs that Westminster is starting to take the problem seriously. And this week, more than 40 Tory MPs signed a letter to Rishi Sunak and the levelling up secretary, Michael Gove, warning that millions of people in traditionally safe Tory seats were facing a double whammy of cuts to local services and higher council tax rates. Here with us in the studio is Joe Harris, vice chair of the Local Government Association and the Lib Dem leader of Cotswold District Council in the West of England. And joining us from Liverpool is Zoe Billingham, the director of the Institute. Institute for Public Policy Research North. It's a think tank which has published research into local councils and the funding challenges they face. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi there. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, Joe, briefly before we start uh, properly getting into this conversation, uh, you have been a councillor since you were 19. 18. So since you were 18? Yeah, since I was 18. And <laughs> it's one of those things I keep, I'm 30 now and I keep going, right, this will be, this will be the last year. Um, all I've ever known is austerity as well. So, you know. <laughs> so, wait, what year was that? I'm not quick enough to do the 2011, maths. 2011. 2011, so, right, okay. Yeah, I get described now as a veteran councillor at the age <laughs> wow. of 30, which I, I don't know whether to be thrilled or terrified, to be honest. I think it's only you and Premier League footballers that can be 30. And veterans. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm going to be retiring soon. I definitely had the moment when you came in, I was like, he looks a bit young. And I had, you know, you have that moment being like, he looks my age, so either he's young or I'm old. Is yeah. it true that your girlfriend has been telling you to get a real job? Uh, well, you know, I don't know I how we've real got that. Job, in, I don't know how the producers have got that information. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more. Have you considered doing something else uh, <laughs> that maybe, you know, pays decently and can provide you with a future? So. Um, Zoe, let's bring you in here. Can you Is sum anyone up- telling you to get a real job, Zoe? <laughs> well, I'm a policy wonk, so absolutely yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can you sum up the situation that the councils are facing? So look, we're at a total make or break moment for local councils. This has been going on for some time. Um, so councillors up and down the country will know that since 2010, we've seen massive cuts to local government budgets and they've lost about a quarter of their spending power. But the, the heavy bit of those cuts has come from government, central government's decision to cut grants to local authorities. So it's very much been in the hands of the government, this decision to really strip back what local government can now provide. And we're really at a crisis moment. As you said, you know, we're seeing councils becoming effectively bankrupt. We're seeing services scaled back and ended. And we're even seeing kind of what is their statutory duties in social services that's providing adult and child social care. We're seeing what statutory minimum means tested to its limit because some councils are having to go, yes, we have to protect these vulnerable people, but actually what what can we what can we do to make it viable? Well, we have to actually even scale back what we're offering our most vulnerable residents. So we're really at a crisis point and it's you know far and about time that Westminster woke up to the to the issues in local government. So when you say we're at make or break point, can you just talk us through what the break half of that looks like? Because uh, because it's a sort of under-discussed issue in the national press, I don't think we're fully cognizant of how big a threat this is. So I think there's, in my mind, kind of been three phases. The very early phases of kind of cuts to local government um, right back in 2010 and 11, you know, the the decision of central government to cut the grant to local government made local government go, okay, well, what can we do a bit differently? Can we do things more effectively with less? And it was a sort of entry period, if you will, to the phase of austerity. Then we moved to another period where 
um, simply kind of certain services were going to just have to be scaled back, you know, a community bus less regular, um, mm. in leisure centres, you know, fewer in your local area. And now we're in what I say is a break moment because there's a real fundamental question about what local government can provide at all. And so now we're not just going to be talking about scaling back services, but getting rid of them entirely. So that's why I say it's a make or break moment, because this is a kind of moment of redefinition of what local government can do, unless central government and Westminster sort of wakes up to to the harsh reality of this and decides to chart a different course and and fund them properly. So, Joe, you you just said you kind of enter the fray in 2011, right at the start of the period um, that Zoe's talking about. What, what was that like stepping into local government and then immediately being told, essentially, you're going to have your funding cut? Any councillor who gets elected, usually they're doing it because they want to improve the local area. There's an issue they've got involved with. Um, it doesn't tend to be people that are hyper-political and want to set out a uh, on a parliamentary grid, so not in the Lib Dems. Um, <laughs> but... Um, you very quickly realise that you're working within a very centralised framework. So, so much of what councils do, actually, the rules are set by government. So there's not really a lot of autonomy, um, certainly in terms of being able to to raise money. And of course, that then limits what you're able to do on the ground. As Zoe said, we've had funding reductions, that core grant that we, you know, pot of money each council gets from um, government has been reducing and reducing and reducing. And the issues that council have had is we we haven't been able to you raise the money to cover the loss in that funding. Can, uh, the government, for example, uh, cap the amount we're allowed to raise in council tax, um, and they also limit the way in which we can raise other forms of um, income. So it's really, really difficult. So if you're setting out, um, you know, trying to improve your area, usually you have a qu- pretty quick reality check. Um, so yeah, it's really frustrating. So Joe, you're vice chair of the LGA, but you're also a council leader from Cotswolds District. I associate the Cotswold with quite a well-heeled, well-to-do, wealthy area. I mean, how's how's your council doing? Yeah, like anywhere, um, you know, we're struggling. The council is struggling. Yes, we're a wealthy area, but we've got, you know, massive financial um, challenges, rising demand and mm. our funding being cut, and we're not able to raise the income to to meet the demand and also cover the money that we're, that we're losing. So what does that look like in real terms? You've mentioned waste collections. For many councils, these used to be weekly. Most are now fortnightly, and some councils are even talking about moving to, um, you know, every every three weeks. Uh, we talk about statutory services. Well, and you know, our council historically has done a lot of non-statutory services. So that's nice things like the leisure centre that yeah. people mm. rely on. That's nice thing like the community outreach that um, that our communities team take part of. And you know. If we keep going on the way we're going mm. down, then there's not really going to be any non-statutory services left. And in many councils, that is that is the case. People look to their council for leadership, mm. but we don't have the funding. Quite often, we don't have the powers to be able to do anything about it. These are figures that have come from the Institute for Government. The uh, grants from central government were cut by 40% in real terms between 2009-10 and 2019-20 from £46.5 billion pounds to £28 billion. Pounds. So that uh, there's no way that that can not have had a huge impact in the ways that councils are operating, the ways they're able to spend money. But up until this point, where it's now Conservative MPs that are banging the drum about this, the government has been very happy to portray this as profligate Labour councils that have, you know, essentially just wasted money that was being given to them. I mean, an example, my hometown of Croydon, the council there, at the time was Labour run and was accused of making a series of uh, bad property investments. And uh, the question that I've never been able to answer is why on earth was Croydon Council engaged in property investment? Like it, it didn't make any sense to me. Do, Joe, do you have any insight into why that would be? Yeah, well, councils have done property over the years to varying degrees and haven't gone bankrupt. Yeah. During the coalition government, um, certainly Eric Pickles, I remember Eric Pickles, he... um. Yeah, he was encouraging councils to invest in property and uh, invest in other things, use public borrowing in order to um, invest in things that would then give councils an income in future. So it was actually encouraged by the government about 10, 10 years ago. And clearly the landscape's changed massively since then. We've had a pandemic, we've had huge inflation with war in Ukraine and so on and so forth. 
And of course, those councils that have perhaps made riskier decisions have ended up with a massive bill and in some instances have, have gone bankrupt. But to say it's just, you know, one party is yeah. absolute rubbish. Woking was conservative. Um, you know, we've seen Labour councils and I'm sure in future we'll see Lib Dem councils. But the common theme with all of them, actually, this isn't a debate about dodgy investments. Yeah, This is just about council funding being a level that can fund those key... Um, key services that people rely on. That's what we're asking for here. If you fund us properly and give us the opportunity to be able to raise money, then we're not going to be running into bankruptcy notices and so on and so forth. Zoe, let me ask you, because I noticed that all the councils that are under threat or have declared themselves bankrupt are all in England. Is there something about devolution that has inoculated Scottish and Welsh councils? Well, you're quite right, Coco, that um, local government is a devolved matter to... um, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. Um, but of course, it's done by through a formula. So they, they still have a knock-on impact of Westminster decisions on their councils and they're still subject to some of the same pressures that we see in England. You know, when you speak to communities across the country, when you're door, door knocking or doing focus groups or whatever, people don't, you know, categorise, oh, that's a local government thing, that's an MP Mm. thing, that's a mayor thing, that's a Welsh government thing. They just want stuff to work. They just want public services to function properly. Um, So it's no surprise that now it's MPs who are starting to kind of clearly get some of the political heat for the decisions being made in Westminster that are impacting on local government. And they're suddenly going, well, hang on a minute, we're going to start getting the blame too. And with an election coming up, of course, that's exactly what they don't want. So does that mean, Zoe, you think that people are now joining the dots with, because they've gone from being angry with their local governments to realising that actually this is a central government problem as well? I think that's right. And, you know, we've just seen a new announcement this morning that potentially um, central government will put another 500 million into local government for the next financial settlement. And that's all well and good. But again, that kind of leaves local government at the mercy of, you know, the decisions of central government, like will they, won't they? Oh, here's a surprise bung here. Um, So it kind of very much shows actually that the, the power, the control is in central government hands. You mentioned that 500 million pounds Bung, I believe, was what you uh, said, which is a great way to put it. What do you reckon, Joe? Is it going to touch the sides? No. I mean, it's an eighth of what we need, or the you know, all councils need, just to stand still. It's great that these MPs have suddenly woken up to this. We have been banging and lobbying MPs for years now on yeah. this. And it was interesting to see that Robert Jenrick was one of those MPs. Well, he was the Secretary of State for councils for, for a few years. So it, it's just... Yeah. It does knock your confidence. I was talking to a Conservative Council leader um, a few weeks ago and he he basically said, it does just feel like the government are taking the piss out of councils. You know, yeah. we're an easy target, we get the blame on the ground and it's just a good deflection tactic for government. So, and it's hard when you look at all the evidence not to sort of, you know, not to sort of take that and think, well, yeah, it's, it, it's pretty accurate. So, you know, we'll work with anybody, whether it's a new Labour government, whether it's a Conservative government or coalition or whatever. We just need funding certainty and we just need whichever government it is to have an idea of what they want local government to do and to look like. I think that's the key point. So, I mean, you've, you've mentioned Eric Pickles and Robert Jenrick, uh, who both sort of had responsibility for communities and local governments uh, at a ministerial level. Um, at various points in the last decade. And one of them encouraged people to make investments that might potentially have been risky. And the other one sort of did nothing and is now somehow trying to portray himself as having banged the drum for this issue, even though he didn't do anything when he could have done something. Yeah, really, really, really frustrating. I think the other key point, and I hate to hate to talk about Brexit, but that whole debate really swallowed up a lot of parliamentary time. So yeah. quite often there wasn't time to talk about important things in Parliament, like council funding, social services, social care. This is the other big unresolved issue, which is a huge ticking time bomb. So you had Brexit, then you had the pandemic, you've had everything going on. So it does. we never get the time we deserve as local councils in Parliament. And that's all we're asking for, certainty and a bit more funding and some more powers. We definitely stagger crisis to crisis here in the UK. Definitely yeah, feels like that. Yeah. <laughs> it is very strange. I always find it quite odd when Brexit gets talked about in the same breath as the pandemic. Yeah. It just sort of, it's a very strange thing of this thing that we voted for that we now talk about and bracket in the same as a 
thing that was like a killer disease. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, let's not let's not get into that. But it's just worth uh, highlighting for a second the scale of, of this crisis. And one of the best ways to do that is just to briefly talk about Birmingham. The, the financial collapse late last year of the largest local authority in the country, Birmingham City Council, should have been the tipping point mm. for a more serious conversation uh, about this. It was tipped into bankruptcy by its mishandling of an equal pay claim and a £100 million IT project. And last week, the council said that up to 600 jobs could be made redundant as it struggles with its huge debt. Now, youth services are one of many areas facing big cuts. Nathan Dennis is the founder and trustee of Birmingham youth charity First Class Foundation. And he told us that he dreads to think what the fallout of that would be. I'm concerned because in 2010, when we had austerity measures and in Birmingham, we had approximately 18 youth services um, closed. We seen a significant impact in young people getting involved with antisocial behaviour, youth crime increasing and youth violence increasing. And then not to add the pressure that we're kind of facing and we see from our charity perspective is a fallout from COVID-19. Um, there's still a lot of fallout in terms of young people struggling with their mental health and struggling to get back into terms of socialisation and what our youth services do that are kind of city council run and provided is create safe spaces for young people to have an appropriate adult where they can connect with, get mentorship from, get counselling from, get advice from. But you know, we're going to work with our partners, that's across the private sector, public sector and voluntary sectors. We're never going to give up on our young people, our city. Our city is a very resilient city and no matter what comes against us, we will always persevere and overcome. Joe, what's your reaction to hearing something like that? Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. He's so positive. He yeah. ended off so positively, to be honest, because it's it, it's so difficult. And you know, youth provision is one of the reasons I got involved. Um, in Gloucestershire, um, so my county area, that used to have responsibility for um, youth service. We don't have anything anymore. Wow. There, there aren't any youth clubs. So, you know, 10, 15 years on from, from the cuts, we've got urban street gangs in little market towns in the Cotswolds and, you know, and obviously the, the chap there is in Birmingham, it's going to be more acute, um, you know, in, in urban centres. So the really difficult thing about something about like youth services is on a spreadsheet, it's quite hard to quantify success because quite often success is 5, 10, 15 mm. years down, down the road when hopefully, you know, offending is falling and people aren't going to prison. So it's really difficult. And of course, if you're a civil servant in the in the ministry um, for levelling up housing and whatever else is in the title, um, that's really, that's really, really difficult because they're just going to go, well, show us, you know, show us value for money. And it's really hard to do that on, on an issue like youth services where you can't immediately see the, see the outcomes. So we're hearing a lot of talk about tax cuts from Sunak and his Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt. However, a YouGov poll found that 62% of voters think the government should prioritise spending more on public services. Does that surprise you? that severe gap between Westminster and the voters. You know, I go canvassing you know, pretty much every week. I'm not meeting anybody saying we really want our tax cut. Most people are saying I want the bus to turn up at the yeah. end of my road. Yeah. I don't want my hospital to have, you know, queues out the door and I want to be able to get a GP appointment. So who are these people asking for tax cuts? Because I'm not meeting <laughs> yeah. them. Maybe I'm talking to the wrong people. And I'm in quite a conservative area, you yeah. would argue, in Gloucestershire. So I think most people just want local services mm. to to work. And I think most people actually would consider, you know, paying a little bit more tax perhaps um, in order to do that. But that's on the proviso that they can actually see things improving because at the minute people pay more tax and everything seems to get worse. So we need to ha really have a look at how local government's funded. Maybe it's time for a more fundamental review of local government and how it's funded and what it um, looks like. And of course, the last time that happened was the poll tax, which, um, as we know, it didn't um, go down well. It didn't go down well. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's probably why politicians nationally don't really want to touch council tax and, and council funding. So we've got a, you know, the issue needs to be sorted one way or another. We need a government, whoever it is, who has a clear idea of what local government can do and should do. Um, and, you know, that is really, really important. OK, so imagining it's Labour... Zoe, do you can you foresee any difference? I mean, at the minute they're they're promising to not spend vastly different to the Tories. Well, I think we've got to kind of reconfigure what we see as 
just straight up spending versus investment. It's not just a deadweight cost. It really is an investment in the future. So I think to any party that comes in at the next general election, I would be absolutely making that case that, you know, prevention and investment in our communities is the right way forward and will be the only way to kind of set us up for a sustainable future rather than these short term bungs that local government are receiving. And there's also a connection to the devolution agenda in England alone. So we've seen, you know, the increased number of metro mayors we have across the country. Um, And of course, you know, combined authorities, metro mayors and their areas are made up of local authorities that are on current trajectory going to be failing um, over the next, you know, few years as we see more and more local authorities going under. So that will also undermine a kind of flagship agenda of both the current government, but also the Labour Party to pursue more mayors, more devolution, but at the same time kind of taking the rug from under the feet of those leaders. So I think it's going to have so many interactions with the rest of what um, the next government might try to do that it there's going to have to be a fundamental that uh, either accepting that local government is fundamentally changed, fundamentally does less and the size of the state is smaller, or, you know, looking at really what realistically it needs in terms of funding. Joe, just in brief, have you picked up any positive signs from Labour? Not really, no. Being br- brutally honest, yeah. I think Angela Rayner, uh, who would be... Um, the Secretary of State for Local Government has mentioned something about building more council houses. Great, but I haven't heard anything on 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 government funding. And that's you know I've got Labour colleagues within local government yeah. who are lobbying within their party and Tories, and I'm doing it in the Lib Dems. So you know we're all beavering away to make sure that this is reflected in manifestos. But I haven't heard anything yet um, from the Labour side or indeed from the Conservative side that leads me to believe anything's going to get better after a general election. If there was a new model for local government funding, what do you think it could be? So I think we need to re- reassess the needs of our local areas. That was done last 10 years ago, looking at the kind of demand, the change in demographic, people living longer and in poorer health, and all these increases on demands and pressures on local governments. We need to reassess the need. And when we do that, um, there will be a re- reassessment of where needs most support from central government. Um, And I think combined with that, we'll need to make sure that however the Treasury calculates how local government finance is distributed, that deprivation is taken into account and deprived local authorities who have the greatest need on their services are given disproportionately more to make sure the system is progressive and catering for our most vulnerable. And then thirdly, are there things that local government could do more of themselves, whether that's devolving certain taxes or allowing them to have more financial scope locally to um, kind of help decide themselves about the level of service provision and the level of taxation and charges that they want to to provide. So I think that's the the three things that we're going to need to see the next government do. Every time we on the show talk about something to do with the steadily collapsing nature of the country around us, it so much of it comes back to decisions that were taken in the early era of the coalition government and specifically the kind of austerity policies that were enacted by David Cameron and George Osborne. I'm sort of not expecting you, either of you to take this question seriously, but does it not just boil your piss <laughs> that one of them is foreign secretary and the other one gets to host a stupid fucking podcast with his idiot friend? Like, <laughs> this, And I, I think the serious thing that I'm trying to ask is, have we ever really appraised the damage that austerity has done to this country because we're still in a climate where the prevailing political conversation amongst the, we assume, outgoing government and the assumed incoming government is one of spending is reckless and the way to show financial prudence is by cutting things and restricting the amount of money that you spend. But is it financially prudent when the entire country has stopped working? Are you both not just like... Livid. I'm I'm furious that these (laughs) two are still just... Totally. Totally. Totally pissed off. And if I see another podcast of, yeah, as you say, two two men of a certain age kind of congratulating each other on the kind of funny quips (laughs) from the time of austerity, you know, it is absolutely infuriating um, that 
that that they've still got the mic, if you will. Mm. They've still got the mic. They've still got the chance to define the terms of the debate. When if anyone can look me in the face and say, you know, a pound spent on youth services, on youth clubs doesn't save you money in the long term and and say that they think that's true. I I would like to see someone say that with a straight face. We know a pound spent on on youth services is worth its buck. We know, and the evidence is there. Um, and as as I said, you know, we need to think very differently about what government spending really means. It's an investment. It's an investment in people. It's an investment in communities. And we need to reshape the terms of the debate. And for as long as we have the same people having the mic holding the terms of the debate, then it's still going to be really hard to fight against it. Yeah, I think you know, if we can exhume David Cameron and stick him in as in the Lords as Foreign Secretary, <laughs> you know, I want Zoe as our Secretary of State for the local government. I think I think we need to make that happen. But no, I think you know if you if you can't how boiled your piss, Joe? Um, you know, it, 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 it's boiling. Yeah, no, just leave it there. Um, I think for me, the, the whole thing of austerity was we're all in this together. And I think the deal kind of was that it's going to be a tough few years where we're going to have to make efficiency savings, but things will get better because we'll be in a better financial um, position. But everything's sort of, nothing's really got better, has it? Everything's got a little bit worse, um, whether that's Brexit, you know, the pandemic, oh, Liz Truss. Things haven't got better. So I think for a lot of people, um, and it probably explains a lot of the political you know, division um, at the minute, things have just people have just seen things get worse and worse and worse, and there aren't. It doesn't really seem to be um, any answers. And I think the challenge for the next government is actually providing a vision of hope, um, which I just don't think we're getting from mm. anybody really at the minute. So, yeah, it's it, it's pretty depressing. I think the idea that any government's going to come in and sort all these issues overnight is fanciful, to be honest. Yeah, that boils my piss. <laughs> Thank you both so much for joining us. Uh, that was such a great conversation. And thank you also both for find, crafting a serious answer to the question, how boiled is your piss? <laughs> I think they should make that a Labour slogan. <laughs> how boiled is your piss? Probably not much with the cost of heat as it is. You know what I'll I mean? You I'll suggest it to the Lib Dem conference. Yeah. Like that. Like... Oh, thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Joe. We appreciate everything you're doing. So it's time to name our PSUK hero and villain of the week. Who's made you cross this week, Nish? My villains this week, Coco, are the Culture Secretary Lucy Fraser and the Transport Minister Hugh Merriman, who this week perfectly illustrated the Conservative Party's continued, depressing and spectacularly ill-informed war on the BBC. Um, So first of all, uh, Lucy Fraser uh, was on Kay Burley Sky News show and was being asked about her comments that she had evidence of BBC bias. Now, before we play the clip of the show, it's worth remembering, as you listen to this, that Lucy Fraser is a lawyer, a a, a KC, a senior lawyer. Now, factor that in to your understanding of what she says constitutes evidence. Let's listen to the clip. The evidence of bias is what audiences believe is the content of the BBC and that's how they... Be- that's not evidence. That's yes. perception. That is evidence. That is evidence. That is ev- Impartiality is about perception of, um, of the things that are being broadcast by the BBC. And the evidence in relation to that perception is that... Um, perception and evidence is, are different things. The evidence from Ofcom, having done studies and questionnaires of the public, is that um, the BBC's um, ratings in relation to impartiality have gone down. And I and the BBC think that there is more that the BBC can do in order to improve that. Was she recently (laughs) kicked in the head by a fucking horse? (laughs) That perception is not evidence. She's a lawyer. Unfathomable. This idea that you know, that the polling data and perceptions can constitute evidence of BBC bias. It doesn't make any sense. But then, having already seen that happen, Hugh Merriman, instead of deciding that that was one of the most embarrassing pieces of human shit that anyone has spoken, decided that he'd seen it as some sort of a gauntlet that was being laid down that he then rose to, again on Kay Burley's show, who's having a good week for not just punching fools in the mouth. He then went on to talk about 
Radio 4's, let's remind ourselves, comedy programme, The News Quiz. This is Hugh Merriman talking about it. I was listening to The News Quiz, which is on Radio 4 at 6.30 on Friday. I was driving from my constituency office to the home. For 10 minutes, all I heard, and it wasn't it's satirical, it was just diatribe against Conservatives, not the government. And I did listen to that and think, for goodness sake, where is the balance in that? So, yes, I'm afraid to say, despite the fact that I've always been a big supporter of the BBC, that struck me as completely biased. OK, you understand that a news quiz is comedy and nothing to do with actual news. There was nothing in that ten minutes that was remotely... But you do understand that it's not it's Of course, not no, I would be news. the first one. I love it when it's politicians like get quiz. lampooned. But it, that was the whole point. Uh, there wasn't actually anything in it in, in that particular regard, which struck me as being sort of amusing. I love it when politicians get lampooned. Nothing says... I have a sense of humour about myself more than using the word lampooned. Um, a BBC spokesperson said, we're confident our audiences know the difference between a long-standing and popular satirical comedy show and our news reporting. <laughs> Merriman also attacked the BBC's coverage of Universal Credit and singling out and naming a journalist. He said, always gave one side of the story and not the other side. Unfortunately, he confused the BBC journalist with Neil Buchanan, the host <laughs> of the children's television show from the 1990s, Art Attack. So already, let's just get this out there. Hugh Merriman is a fucking imbecile who doesn't know what he's talking about. And it should be real evidence of how the Conservative Party has descended into people like Lucy Fraser, who, based on their qualifications, should know better, but are defending these nonsensical and ultimately indefensible positions and people like Hugh Merriman who are just shit that's floated to the top of the tank because there's no water left in it, right? Now, I do just want to briefly talk about BBC comedy because this is obviously something that personally affects me, not least because the programme in question, the news quiz, is hosted by my very good friend, Andy Zaltzman, who was also a brilliant on guest on yeah. the show. Brilliant guest on our uh, end of year wrap-up special of Pod Save the UK. Check it out. It's still on the pod feed, of course. When I worked within the BBC, me and the programme caused a huge amount of stink about uh, bias in BBC comedy and the comedy was a sort of war on the government. What I will say is this, having worked in the BBC comedy department, a huge amount of effort is made to ensure that there is some representation of jokes about all sides of the political spectrum. What I would also say is if you don't want to be made fun of, get the fuck out of government because a satirical news show is always going to focus most of its attention on the government of the day because that's where all of the news stories come from. That's where the power in the country resides. I think I speak for a lot of people in this country when I say, maybe just stop being in government then, <laughs> Conservatives, if you're that upset about people making jokes about you. Look at the last two years of Conservative government. We have had three different prime ministers one of whom had to be removed from office because he was having too many birthday parties during the COVID lockdown. The second one was in office for less time than the lifespan of a lettuce. And the third one is now in office because no one else wanted to do the job. Tell me that Boris Johnson, Liz Truss and Rishi Sudak are not absolutely hilarious. They've just brought David Cameron back like a soap that's running out of ideas. I'm sorry, if you want people to make less fun of you, stop doing things that are obviously hilarious. I did enjoy listening to Hugh Merriman essentially say he listened to 10 minutes of it and he didn't find it funny. <laughs> and I can assure you that if he listened to the last 10 minutes of this, he would not find it funny. <laughs> and I think maybe you should send him a... You've got a new tour, don't you, mate? Send him some tickets. Send him a little DVD. Dear Hugh, interested in your thoughts. <laughs> Love Nish. Uh, the, the, um, the last time I did some jokes about uh, the government on the news, uh, let's just put it this way. How did it go? I no longer host a comedy <laughs> show on the BBC about the news. Oh, no. Let's lower my blood pressure yes. uh, and uh, the volume chart on the listeners' podcast app uh, by having Coco uh, talk to us about uh, the PSUK Hero of the Week. So my Hero of the Week is a judge called Anne Fairpo. So she was sitting as the judge in a tax tribunal where Walker's Crisps were trying to have their sensations poppered on range classed as a food rather than a snack. That was so they could potentially save millions of pounds in tax. You know how I feel about taxes, Nish, and paying them. So Anne Fairpo made herself a hero to everyone by ruling that they were not actually poppadoms, but they were, in fact, crisps. And I'm sure we can agree as Asians, we needed well, that. Well, she, what she's legally saying is, 
Those are not puffadums. Those are not puffadums. Your stupid crisps are not puffadums. How dare you say that this potato-based snack is a puffadum, which we all know is made from gram flour. Anyway, so she ruled that snacks are similar to potato crisps and so are not eligible for zero-rated VAT. As a result, walkers will have to continue to pay the standard 20% VAT on them. Walkers also argue they were not a crisp as they were named puffadums. Well, we called them puffadums, they said. And in response, Judge Anne Fairpo said... Nominative determinism is not a characteristic of snack foods. Calling a snack hula hoops does not mean that one could twirl that product around one's midriff, <laughs> nor is Monster Munch generally reserved as a food for monsters. <laughs> I love it when the judges do you it. You love a judge one's with a self. sense of humour. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's a judge who's made a ruling with a sense of humour. It's one in the eye for cultural appropriation <laughs> and tax avoidance. Yeah. It's all round a good story. And it sits sw- squarely in the interest of the podcast that, as we said before, we and only we refer to as the news Asians. So Anne Fairpo, you are a legend and our PSUK Hero of the Week. If you've got something you'd like to share with us, uh, comments on what you've heard, or if you have a question about British politics, you can get in touch with us by emailing psuk at reducedlistening.co.uk. It's always nice to hear your voices, so do send us a voice note on WhatsApp. Our number is 07514 644 572. Internationally, that's plus 44 7514 644 572. We have received an overwhelming number of responses to Podshag the UK, our fake dating service that we offhandedly suggested as a joke, but is, in the words of one of our producers, getting quite out of hand. I'm very sorry. I've been specifically told we can't read out any more dating profiles. <laughs> and don't forget to follow Pod Save the UK on Instagram and Twitter. You can also find us on YouTube for access to full episodes and other exclusive content. And if you're as opinionated as we are, please do consider leaving us a review. I mean, we couldn't stop people using the review section as a dating profile. If, if you we want to use the review them. section of the podcast as a place to deposit your dating profiles, we are unable to stop that from happening. No. And we couldn't stop people using YouTube comments as a way to put their... I don't think anyone should use YouTube comments <laughs> as a way to find a partner. No, I think that's Unless wrong. the partner you're looking for is a Nazi. <laughs> Uh, Pod Save the UK is a reduced listing production for Crooked Media. Thanks to senior producer Musty Aziz and digital producer Alex Bishop. Video editing was by David Kaplowitz and the music is by Vasilis Fotopoulos. Thanks to our engineer David Dagahi. The executive producers are Anishka Sharma, Dan Jackson and Madeline Herringer with additional support from Ari Schwartz. Remember to hit subscribe for new shows on Thursdays on Amazon, Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>